Ready? Yeah. <clears throat> we'll bring his hearing to, uh, to order. I'd like to say good morning to everyone. Um, I'd also like to, to uh, definitely welcome Sec Secretary Geithner to the committee. Um, he is the first Secretary of the Treasury to testify for this committee, and so we appreciate that, uh, uh, obviously appreciate that very much. More than two years after the President's inauguration, the economy still remains stagnant. Growth is anemic, unemployment hovers around 9 percent, and that figure excludes those who have simply given up looking for a job. No Republican or Democrat can be satisfied with those results. However, every single member of this committee truly believes in one thing, and that is the recovery will be led by the ingenuity and drive of America's entrepreneurs. To accomplish that goal, small businesses need, to need capital in order to purchase inventory, invest in plant and equipment, and hire workers. America's entrepreneurs simply will be unable to revive the economy without access on reasonable terms to debt or equity capital. There is little doubt that the environment for obtaining debt financing is difficult for small businesses. This committee has heard on multiple occasions that entrepreneurs cannot get credit and small businesses face significant cuts to their existing lines of credit. Bankers have told this committee that they have capital <clears throat> but are nervous about lending because the, regulator, because the regulations might question the safety of the loans of those small businesses. Nor can small businesses easily turn to equity markets. To do so, they must navigate a complex series of Federal and State regulations. Those businesses then face significant ongoing regulatory costs in order to comply with the security laws, including Dodd-Frank and Sarbanes-Oxley. These are resources that can be better spent hiring new employees. Today's hearing focuses on the efforts by the Department of the Treasury to improve small businesses' access to credit through the small uh, State Small Business Credit Initiative and the Small Business Lending Fund. These programs are designed to bolster the capital available to community banks so that they can then lend to small businesses. I didn't support these initiatives, and opposition came from both sides of the aisle. The opponents did not object to the worthy goals of this program. Rather, <coughs> they do not believe that the incentives provided will generate sufficient new lending to small businesses, as that term is defined by the Small Business Act. Despite my concerns about these programs, I want to do everything possible to help small businesses obtain needed capital. And with that in mind, I would like to hear from Secretary uh, Geithner about the potential benefits of these two programs. I also want to know whether the Secretary believes changes to the programs might provide greater capital access to small businesses. And finally, I am sure that the Committee would like to hear any suggestions on improving, improving the ability of small businesses to obtain equity capital. I recognize that the programs have not been in full operation, and the Secretary would be welcome to return and discuss these initiatives uh, after the Department has had greater operational experience uh, with those programs. Uh, now, before yielding to the ranking member for her opening statement, um, it is my understanding that the Secretary has obligations that are very vital uh, to all members of this committee and to Congress, uh, which are going to require him to leave at noon. So as a result of that, I am going to strictly enforce the, uh, uh, the five-minute rule. And with that now, I will turn to uh, uh, Ranking Member Velasquez for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Secretary, and welcome. In early 2007, when the financial crisis began to emerge, no one could have predicted the economic damage that will follow. For small businesses, the capital markets dried up, leaving many unable to find lines of credit. To address this, actions were taken, many in fact led by the Small Business Committee. These measures were successful. Thanks to these policy changes, along with gradual, although uneven, economic improvement, small firms are now better able to secure capital than at any time since the heart of the crisis in 2008. 2009. These more favorable credit conditions have been confirmed by both the Federal Reserve and the Thomson Reuters Pay Net Small Business Lending Index. The Fed reported that a net 15 percent of banks eased terms, while the Thomson Reuters Index rose 17 percent in April from a year earlier. This represented the ninth straight double digit rise in the index. Even the NFIB measures of credit conditions remains near a two-year high. These are very positive developments since small firms have been all but locked down of capital markets for a long time. Unfortunately, while credit conditions have loosened for borrowers, we are not seeing corresponding increases 
in overall commercial lending. In fact, lending now is below the level reached in June 2006, declining by $15 billion in the most recent quarter. Total small business loans dropped 2.4 percent from $624 billion in December 2010 to $609 billion in March 2011. Small loans of less than 100,000 were down by 2.9 percent, while large loans outstanding declined by 2.2 percent. From the broadest possible view, small businesses are getting less capital than they did five years ago. As demonstrated by the many hearings this committee held in the last four years, the reasons behind this decline are complicated. However, we do know that banks are flush with more cash than at any other time in history. Banks are holding nearly $1.6 trillion in reserves at the Fed, of which only a small portion are required reserves. This is nearly double where they stood just two years ago when banks held only $900 billion at the Fed. Clearly, liquidity is not a problem for lenders. With that in mind, today we will examine Treasury's SBL, uh, SBLF program, an initiative designed to increase small business lending in one particular way, liquidity. Only 847 banks applied for $11.6 billion from the fund by its June 6 deadline, less than half of the $30 billion made available. If liquidity was a problem, there would be a line out of the door for SBLF funds, rather than the lack of interest we are now seeing from lenders. There are two areas in particular that I hope to review today. The SBLF lack of requirement that its funds be used by banks to make to make small business loan undermines the supposed intent of the program. Instead, the SBLF relies on loose incentives and non-binding plans to channel capital to small firms. I do not believe this is enough. You know that, Mr. Secretary, throughout the debate, that was an issue and concern that I raised. The problem is compounded by the initiative relying on an overly broad and vague definition of small businesses. So when banks do lend, it will be virtually impossible to know if they are lending to true small businesses or actually large corporations. During the debate to pass the SBLF, the rationale most offered by its proponents was that we needed to quickly put a policy in place and that the SBLF could be implemented within six months. But here we are more than nine months after passage and no one single investment has been made in the nine months since enactment. It could be several more months before any SBLF dollars make their way through banks and into the hands of entrepreneurs. All of these issues are, are as relevant today as they were when the legislation was considered. And so with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank uh, and I yield back. Thank you very much. And Secretary Geithner, your entire written testimony will be entered into the record. And uh, you are now recognized to give your uh, statement. Thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Velasquez and members of the committee, it is good to come before you today to talk about this uh, broader challenge. You know, I know we haven't always agreed on the best way to advance this objective of helping small businesses, but we have had to, and we've had to make some compromises to get things done. But I know we all share that basic objective of looking for ways we can make it easier for small businesses to expand and to invest and to hire. Now, as you both said, this financial crisis took a very heavy toll on small businesses and American workers. You know, in the month the President took office, job losses peaked at about 820,000, and the recession ultimately claimed more than 9 million jobs. Our efforts over the past two and a half years have helped restore economic growth. The President righted the ship, put out the fire, and we have now seen 15 straight months of private sector job growth. More than 2 million Americans have gone back to work over that period, 1 million within the last six months alone. But, of course, even as, as uh, economic growth continues, we continue to face very substantial economic challenges. And in order to help strengthen this recovery, help get more Americans back to work, we need to continue to find ways to help small businesses. Uh, as you all know, uh, half of the workforce of this country is employed by companies with fewer than 500 employees. Now, the recession hit small businesses especially hard, and that's for two reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, is because so much of the recession was concentrated in construction. 
and small businesses are, of course, are disproportionately concentrated in, in the construction and real estate areas. The second reason is because small banks, small businesses were most directly affected by the contraction in credit we saw across the financial system. Uh, small businesses are more dependent on bank loans than are large businesses, and therefore they were more affected by the pressures we saw on small banks across the country, and they were more affected by the withdrawal of credit for loans backed by real estate and, of course, the broader contraction in credit card lending. Now, in view of these challenges, we worked with Congress over the past couple of years to implement a series of programs. I want to describe briefly and summarize briefly uh, the basic elements of that strategy. The first was to provide a significant amount of additional tax relief targeted at small businesses. We have supported um, 17 direct specific tax rates for small businesses, many of them through the Recovery Act. Uh, overall, these 17 specific tax breaks are estimated to save small businesses more than $50 billion over the 10 years over the classic budget window. And this means that the overall tax burden for small businesses is lower today than when the President took office. We propose in the budget some additional long-term uh, tax relief for small businesses, which I would be happy to describe in more detail. Second element of our strategy was to help small businesses get more access to capital, access to credit on more favorable terms. We are now implementing two public-private partnerships, the Small Business Lending Fund and the State Small Business Credit Initiative, which are designed to leverage government resources with the local knowledge of community banks and state credit programs. We have already approved 10 states for the State Credit Initiative, including the announcement today that Kansas will receive funding to spur more than $132 million in small business lending. Now, these capital programs are one of the most cost-effective ways we know that Congress can help encourage small business lending, because every dollar of capital that Congress provides can be leveraged to support le lending that is many multiples of the government's investment. And the bank capital programs that were at the center of the government's emergency programs that began under the last administration have demonstrated uh, the effectiveness of this approach. We have seen these broad programs, capital investments banks, yield a significant positive return to the taxpayer, and they were decisive, of course, in bringing about the overall improvement in credit conditions that the ranking member referred to. Now, as you know, in addition to these direct, uh, these new types of credit programs, we have, uh, uh, with the help of this committee, increased the SBA 7A and 504 loan guarantee programs and permanently increased SBA loan limits. The Community Development Financial Institutions Fund continues to be a critical source for capital to reach underserved communities through a variety of programs, including the New Market Tax Credit Program. And through the Startup America Initiative and other efforts, we are looking at ways to reduce barriers to equity capital. The Chairman referred to this, that are so important for startups and other high-growth, innovative small businesses. The third piece of our strategy uh, is about regulatory reform. Uh, the President has directed Cass Sunstein at OMB to lead a government-wide review of existing regulations so that we can eliminate or fix rules that are outdated and unjustifiably costly, and to make sure that new regulations undergo a more rigorous process of review. And of course, as part of this effort, we are going to take a close look at how we can remove unnecessary barriers and burdens to small businesses. The fourth piece of our strategy uh, is about Federal contracting opportunities for small businesses, which we are committed to work to expand. We are very pleased that a third of the Recovery Act dollars went to small businesses. We want to look for ways to do more. Uh, and finally, we are looking at ways to improve export opportunities for small businesses. As part of the President's broad national export initiative, we placed a uh, high priority on helping small businesses access foreign markets. My testimony uh, lays out in more detail. Uh, the scope of those programs. Now, uh, these, these initiatives, these programs, we believe are very important to continue to help small businesses expand, uh, hire, and invest. Uh, we have got a lot of challenges ahead. And I want to just end by saying that it is very important that as we work to, towards a bipartisan, comprehensive agreement to reduce our long-term deficits, we make sure that we reach agreement on a program that is good for the economy that does not endanger the recovery, and that helps make sure that we can retain, remain competitive in the long run. If we meet that test, then we can help small businesses uh, thrive uh, as we recover. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I'll start uh, 
uh, with questions. And I ask that uh, if other members have uh, opening statements, please submit them for the uh, uh, for the record so we can get the majority of our questions in. Um, <clears throat> and basically, my my question is, I mean, it, it's fairly simple, and I'm just looking for reasons why we can't. We seem to have a uh, a gap here, and we hear in testimony every single week. Um, from bankers that come in here and they tell us they've got money to lend. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's kind of, you know, with the fact that uh, uh, I pointed out and the ranking member pointed out too, even with the Small Business Lending Fund, that, that uh, you know, we've only seen a portion of that, uh, or at least some, a few banks apply for it. But banks say they have money to lend, and yet we have small businesses come in here every single week also and tell us they can't get uh, capital. And, you know, we're trying to find a reason for that. And can, I mean, do you have any ideas, thoughts? What, what is causing the problem here with, uh, or, or the, uh, uh, you know, this divide that nobody seems to be able to cross? Well, Mr. Chairman, that's the right question, and then I'll give you my sense. Uh, and, of course, like, like you, I talk to small businesses across the country all the time, and I hear the same things. People still say it's very hard to get credit. We think we deserve it. We should be able to have access to it. Banks were throwing money at us before the crisis, and now it's dried up. We think that's unfair. It's hurting our capacity to expand and invest. Many of them say that, you know, we're just on the verge of being able to, we're seeing more demand for our products. We'd like to meet that demand, but we can't do it unless we have more working capital. So I think you're absolutely right about the, the nature of the problem. And I think the, the, uh, the way to explain why it still feels that bad is just to remind people that the crisis caused a huge amount of damage. It's going to take years for us to dig our way out of that hole. A lot of the damage was concentrated in construction, where a lot of small businesses operate. And the credit damage caused by the crisis hurt a lot of small banks' capacity to lend and hurt a lot of the classic lending channels that small businesses rely on. So I think those are the best explanations for why it still feels, still feels so bad. Uh, it is fair that to acknowledge that you know, examiners across our banking agencies, state and federal, are trying to be more careful. You know, they, they look back at the experience of the judgments they made on the run-up to the crisis. They felt they were behind the curve in lots of ways, and they are being very careful. Now, it may be too careful in some ways. The typical thing you see in recessions, coming out of recessions caused by financial crises, is that, uh, is that there's a risk that supervisors and examiners overreact. And after a period of being maybe being a little too loose, they tend to overdo it. And so I think it's very important, as we try to make sure these programs reach as many people as we can, that the federal banking agencies continue to try to give their examiners more balanced guidance. So again, they don't try to they don't make these problems unnecessarily worse by overdoing it. They, sh they should be cautious. They should be careful, but they don't need to overdo it. We're actually. I mean, we hear some of that. You know exactly what you said when it comes to the examiners. You know they're either requiring more equity for the same line of credit on a business that's never missed a, a payment, or they're lowering their line of credit. Uh, you know, the same equity, the reverse. Yeah. But uh, do you think that? Do you think that small businesses out there are? Um, you know, and one of the the things that I worry about too is small businesses just sitting on cash that they may have too. And do you think that, that the concern over the deficit or the concern over the debt um, is hampering that growth? Or, or do you think that small businesses are holding back just as a result of that uh, alone? I think it's a good question. You know, that we have a bunch of surveys that some of you cited that uh, we use to got to as a measure of what fall small businesses say their main challenges are. And I think those surveys have consistently said throughout the crisis that the biggest challenge they face, the biggest source of uncertainty, is over how much growth and demand for their products they're going to see. And although we've had now uh, about 18 months of positive growth, uh, because the crisis was so traumatic and caused so much uncertainty, so much damage, you know, this is something that most Americans had never experienced before in their lifetime, never thought they'd experience. And that has lasting damage to confidence. And people are a little more tentative, uh, given the shocks caused by the crisis, about, uh, about how strong growth is going to be in the future. That seems to be the main effect. However, having said that, I agree very much that if Congress can find a way to reach a bipartisan, comprehensive, balanced agreement to bring down a long-term deficit, that that would help. It would be a sign that Washington works, is able to try to come together and solve some problems. And I think that would improve overall confidence across the country. Of course, how we do that is very important. As I said at the end, um, it's important not just to bring more gravity to our fiscal position, demonstrate that we can live within our means, but we have to do that in a way that's going to be good for growth, good for the economy in the near term and good for the economy in the long run. 
and th that's a complicated uh, challenge. <clears throat> I have a lot more questions. I'm going to uh, defer to the ranking member because I want to make sure that uh, our other members have the opportunity to ask, and, and I'll ask at the end if we still have time. Uh, ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the fo I would like to discuss the SBLF uh, program. The focus of it basically was liquidity, to address the issue of the lack of liquidity. Um, given the fact that only less than 10 percent of the banks who qualify for these funds have applied, um, why is it that more lenders are not applying? It's a, it's a good question, and I should say that you know you referred to our um, debates and discussions about how best to solve this problem, and I very much respect not just your record of accomplishment on these issues, um, and I know you've had a slightly different view than us, uh, and I respect those views, so I'll give you my, my sense. Uh, we've had about uh, roughly almost 850 banks apply. Uh, I think that's a pretty good and reasonable number of banks. I think it suggests a fair amount of interest, although you said you know, we're a country with 9,000 banks, 8,000 banks, so it's, it's not a large fraction of banks, but it's a pretty substantial number, and not all of them will qualify. Uh, and you're right to say you can't be certain what you're going to see in but terms of the return on those investments. But we think it will be positive. You don't think that is because of the TARP ex, uh, stigma? I think that, uh, and, you, and you're, you're right to recognize that, you know, we've done this in, in three stages, this, mm -hmm. these broad approaches to credit. We're, we're experimenting a bit. And what we found in the first stage of TARP, as you know, was we saw hundreds of banks withdraw their applications for the program because they were worried about the stigma. And they were worried that if they came and took capital from the, from the, from the government, that they would be uh, penalized in the eyes of their competitors and their creditors and their customers. And so they withdrew in waves. And therefore, that instrument was not as powerful as we thought it would be for small banks. Uh, That's partly why we try to design a complementary program that had less stigma. Another reason could be that banks are sitting in uh, record amount of cash. Well, it's, I think you're right to say, if you look across the, uh, across the banking system, that banks today have much more capital than they did before the crisis. And you're seeing them not face, not, they're not facing much loan demand yet, and a little tentative to use that in some cases. But uh, what this program tries to do is reach a subset of the banking system that can't raise capital on their own, uh, but are still viable institutions. That's not going to be the bulk of banks, but it's going to be a, a meaningful fraction of banks. What will Treasury do with the excess funds um, that will not be used for the SBLF? That's, that's a judgment only, only Congress can make. We, we have no authority to use the funds once we run out of time and once we've reached the ones we think are eligible. So if you don't use it because banks will not apply, will you recommend to Congress to rescind uh, the funds? Yeah, you know, I, I haven't really thought about it yet. We've been focused on trying to get this, get this moving, um, but we'd be happy to talk to you about what the best, what the best use of those uh, remaining authority is. Well, you heard the chairman, and uh, in my opening statement, I also make reference to the fact that time and again, businesses are coming here telling us that they're having, and these are creditworthy uh, companies, and still are not getting any um, uh, affordable capital. So uh, in a, do you think, do you expect that the SBLF fund will change this trend? Well, I, I think it's going to make a meaningful difference for the banks that qualify and, and are eligible, and it'll make a meaningful difference for their customers. Because again, the, you know, the central it's, it's, the central feature of this program is that you get a dollar of capital, mm -hmm. and that means you have between eight and twelve additional dollars of lending capacity. If you're short capital, it's less likely you have to cut your lending to your cre cut credit lines to your customers by that magnitude. If you have ample demand for loans and capital, then you can leverage that money substantially. So it will make a meaningful difference for the banks that apply and a meaningful difference to their customers, and, well, and, and in a very efficient way for the Congress. I think, I think one of the most efficient ways we have to use the taxpayers' money to try to incent investment and hiring. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 having no effect, 10 satisfying the capital needs of small businesses, at the end of the day, how do you um, qualify the SBL fund will land well, on a scale of 1 to 10? I think I would repeat what I said. It will make a meaningful contribution. We are a $14 trillion economy. We have 8,000 banks. We have had 850 roughly apply. The total capital, you said they have applied for about $12 billion in authority. So it is it's, it's a 
meaningful for those that are eligible, mm -hmm. meaningful for their, their customers. But of course, you're right to say we're a large economy. Mr. Secretary, uh, throughout my discussion with uh, Treasury staff, uh, I was told that the program will be up and running in six months. And I, quite, I am quite disappointed that still it's not a single money has been disbursed uh, to a small company, a small firm. Uh, when will the first small business actually see this money? Very soon, but thank you for asking that question again. You said in your opening remarks, and let me explain to you why we're here, because we're, we're a little disappointed, too, a little surprised. It's been a little slower than we thought. Let me explain why. In the system Congress, in the, in the program Congress legislated, there are very strong protections to protect the taxpayer, a, as you would expect. Very important that those exist. And in, in our system, we rely on two safeguards for that. One is we require the applications to be reviewed by their primary bank supervisor, and we don't consider them unless they get recommended by the bank supervisor. That program leaves us vulnerable to the time it takes those regulators to be careful and review. But also we have to look independently at them, and we're trying to be careful. So we're a little slower than we thought, but we're very close to moving ahead. And again, I'm very confident you're going to see a very meaningful impact on the institutions that are eligible and we're close to being able to un unleash that capital. I have many more questions, but uh, in light of when, what guarantees are we going to have that community banks or the banks, financial institutions that will get these funds will provide small business loan? Well, it, it, you know this debate as well as anybody. Uh, you c we do not have the capacity, and the program does not give us the ability to force banks to lend. We don't think we can do that. What we did is something different. We created a program structured to provide very powerful incentives for them to lend. But as you said, they are incentives. They are not guarantees. They are not compulsory. But if a bank does not lend above the baseline of lending that, uh, that preceded the enactment of the law, then they have to pay a higher dividend. So their incentives are pretty strong. But you are right to point out that we don't have the power to compel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Herrera Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. The, I'm going to follow along the same lines of the Small Business Lending Fund. I have some real concerns. I mean, I've had, whether it's been small businesses who have said, hey, look, this is one of the only games in town, or I've had several community banks and credit unions, credit worthy, right? I had a, a, a bank fail in my largest county. So I'm, I'm learning the difference here. Uh, we're talking about credit-worthy financial institutions who have come in and said, can you help us with Treasury? We can't get a response. That was in my first couple of months here. You know, as, as it's drug on, we're now at six months plus, mm -hmm. and as we communicate with Treasury, we get told, we hope so. So when I, when I filter through kind of the answer I heard you uh, give the ranking member had to do with, um, you know, getting approval through a primary bank supervisor and then an independent review the whole, correct me, I wasn't here, so please do correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I thought the whole purpose of getting this small bit of cash infusion to those small community banks to get out to small businesses in a short term was the goal. What is happening with the money, and can you give us a time, a time guarantee? Because it should not take this long. Well, uh, I, I wish it were otherwise, but uh, we're doing what I think you'd want us to do and you'd expect us to do and you would hold us accountable for, which is we are being careful with the taxpayer's money. Uh, if you think about U.S. banking system today and community banks today, they fall roughly into three categories. There are banks that are very strong, we're very careful, mm -hmm. can go raise capital, and uh, therefore can expand their lending to their customers on their own, have no interest in coming to the government for help. There are a lot of other banks who got themselves way underwater, lent too much to commercial real estate or in sectors affected by the crisis, innocent victims of the recession, mm -hmm. who may not survive, don't have enough capital, and we cannot justify uh, helping keep them alive. Yeah, and now, limp, But then there are banks in the middle who this program can help that are viable, can't raise capital on their own because those markets are still much more intent about lending to banks given the, given the crisis. But we, can, we think there is a good way to, responsible way to reach those banks, mm -hmm. but they will not uh, protect banks from failing, a lot of banks from failing, and there are a lot of banks that would like this capital that will not be eligible. I wish it were different, but the reason why we are a little behind schedule is because we are being careful and because the regulators are being careful 
and that's what you would like us. That's what you want us to be. Well, with that, I, I think you're right. There are going to be banks who are are still teetering, right? And Washington State's had a, a were fourth or fifth, I think, in terms of bank closures. Um, but again, I'm not talking about. And we had Washington Mutual. I'm not talking about a big bank that made a lot of these uh, risky loans, right? Got in the subprime market. I'm talking about community institutions, Heritage Bank in Olympia, uh, uh, IQ Credit Union in Vancouver. I'm talking about financial institutions who have weathered this, continue to weather this well, and cannot get a response from Treasury. Well, again, we will be as responsive as we can uh, and we will be as clear with people about if they don't meet the test, the regulator's test or our test, we will make sure we are in them. But just a little, little context without commenting on the specific banks you, 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 you mentioned. You are right to say that in general this was a crisis not caused by small banks. But it is also true that if you look at small banks across the country in the run up to this crisis, a very substantial number of those banks got themselves very, very exposed to commercial real estate as a share of capital, therefore very, very vulnerable. Absolutely. And it's, it's hard for any of us to, uh, any of you really, or even me in this context, to, to know. Let me uh, reclaim my time really quickly, because I recognize there were a lot of banks who got out over the tip of their skis. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about credit-worthy institutions who cannot get a response from, from right. the Treasury, but, but from you, your but, office. Right. Uh, let me finish. From your office on wh whether or not they are approved or not approved. Oh, no, they'll, they'll, six get that, months. They'll, they'll get that response. But again, the reason why uh, people haven't heard from us yet is because we depend on the regulators to review these applications. Mm -hmm. We don't even see them until they get meet that review. When they see them, we look at them. And we'll make those judgments as quickly as we can. But uh, again, none of you, I hate to say it, are, will be in a position to make a judgment independently on your own about whether they're viable or not. That's a judgment that you need to leave to, and the law is designed this way, leave to the checks and balances we've set up. Let, let me, the last couple of seconds. Well, then, if, if this turns out that of the banks um, that maybe we can't judge as credit worthy, uh, or the credit unions, institutions do not do not uh, meet your criteria. Is that money going to then be returned? Oh I mean, well. The, what the, the happens way, to that money if we're not way, lending it and it's not getting to small businesses? The way the law of the land works, um, if there is money left over, meaning there there's not eligible institutions mm -hmm. uh, come on a scale to use all that money, then that money is left to the Congress to choose what it what it wishes to do with that. It, it can't be used. We can't use it. And you can make your own judgments, and this committee should take a look at that. What would be a better use of those, uh, uh, those, uh, those uh, funds? I yield back. Thank you. <coughs> General from Pennsylvania, Mr. Omar. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. And when we confirmed your appearance here, I went back to my district and talked with some key small business <coughs> owners and asked them what they would like for me to ask you, given the opportunity. And universally, businesses in my district are saying that lenders are focused primarily on real estate, and you addressed this in your testimony, real estate loans rather than on providing the working capital that will enable small firms to rehire the people they have had to lay off and expand their operations and their employment, which has led lenders to state that there is no demand and businesses are claiming there is no supply, the push and pull that you described earlier. So how can the Treasury ensure that businesses are getting the loans that they need in that climate? Can't ensure. Uh, you know, we can help, but we can't ensure. And you haven't given us the authority or the power to ensure, and I don't think you could. All we can do is through this mix of things, and it's a very substantial mix of programs we put in place. <coughs> the SBA guarantees the capital programs, the tax incentives. They were doing as much as we can to help them to get their way out of this as quickly as possible, but we can ensure. And you know, you uh, countries um, facing these challenges over the decades have tried all sorts of different ways to get capital directly to companies who need who need businesses, and those those programs are littered with failure and waste and distortion and politics. Uh, it's not a record you want us to emulate, and because of that, we're left with uh, the tools we have, which to try to work through banks, use the knowledge banks have about who's creditworthy, who isn't, not to make those judgments independently but try to make it economically, more economically attractive for them to lend. Right. And for many lenders, uh, when making a determination of creditworthiness, the discussion we were having earlier, they look at the past year or two. Obviously, that was not a good time in the economy, and it is difficult for any business to have shown a profit in that time period. And the Fed, Federal Reserve, has encouraged lending to creditworthy businesses to aid the recovery. But to date, the Fed has yet to define what creditworthy means. 
So the uncertainty further compounds the lender's fears that regulators will penalize them for making loans that will later be found to have been made to non-creditworthy businesses. So what guidance can the Treasury offer or have you offered to help define what creditworthy means? And do Treasury's lending initiatives allow for a longer term review beyond the two years for a business's finances? Uh, we can't uh, really make that judgment for the regulators or their banks. Uh, not something we can do. Uh, but the programs we set up don't um, would still give the primary regulators the discretion to make a judgment about uh, whether banks are looking at credit risk in a more balanced, reasonable way. And you're right to say that when you have a crisis like this, you know this was this is something that could have been a second Great Depression, and you saw a huge amount of business failure, a huge loss of wealth, huge trauma to the American economy. It's made everybody too tentative, a little too tentative, too cautious. And I think a real challenge we all face is to try to make sure people look forward and look at the earnings capacity of these businesses, recognizing that we'll be coming out of this over time, and you want to make sure they give as much weight to the future as they give to the recent past. Right. And lastly, Mr. Secretary, uh, in Western Pennsylvania, venture capital, something I hear a lot about, and, and access has been an issue recently. And it's proven to be a critical driver in producing the high-tech, high-growth jobs, and new businesses can create jobs that would fuel the economy in the way that we all hope to see. Do you think that more of a focus should have been put in retrospect on this type of equity investment rather than solely on debt financing? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I think you're right to say that you know one of the great strengths of the American financial system before the crisis was the we were really better than any country in the world at, at helping small businesses get access to equity capital and debt capital early stage. And we've got to make sure we're recreating that fundamental strength of our system. And you're right that uh, angel investments and early stage equity investments are very important to innovative uh, companies. And we're looking at a range of ways to help, help that. Uh, on the credit side, though, our judgment was we have to work really with the knowledge of community banks, not try to try to independently make judgments at which companies are credit worthy, which ones they aren't. But we think there are some other things we can do on the equity side, and we're working closely with the SEC and the SBA and others in that direction. We'd be happy to, uh, happy to uh, talk to your colleagues about how best to do that. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. <coughs> the gentleman from Florida, Mr. West. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Geithen. Great to see you here today. Uh, last week, Friday, I had the opportunity to speak to the Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce. And, of course, there were a lot of uh, local community bankers that were there. And, again, the reoccurring theme always seems to be, you know, we want to provide that access to capital, but we're seeing an increase of regulation. We're seeing more examiners coming down. They really don't understand things going on here on the ground and, and that relationship. And in the six short months that I spent here, I've learned that in Washington, D.C., if it's worth reacting to, it's worth overreacting to. So I'm just wondering, is anyone at the Treasury, going back maybe now and looking at the Dodd-Frank law and looking at maybe the potential negative impacts that uh, we could find on small businesses and those community banks, the large banks have these huge staffs. They can take care of these things. But the small banks and that relationship with small business, is, is it a possibility we can go back and review Dodd-Frank? Well, um, I, I want to, I think you're raising a, a really important question, and, and, I, and I, I agree that the main challenge in thinking about regulation is how to get the balance right. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious, uh, looking back at the financial crisis, we got a whole bunch of things wrong as a country and how, how much oversight we put over the banking system, and we have to fix that. Mm -hmm. And that's what Dodd-Frank was designed to do, but we have to be careful we don't overdo it. I yeah. completely agree with you. I do not believe that, well, let me say it affirmatively, I think Dodd-Frank was caref very carefully designed to make sure that small businesses were not the object of a huge increase in regulation or a meaningful increase in regulation. In fact, but there's a little collateral damage that has happened. Well, well let's get to let's get, let's go, It's a good question. I think that they were largely protected, insulated from the core provisions of the Act. The Act was really designed at the big failures by large institutions and markets. And that's why I just want to read you this quote from from Camp Fine when the bill was passed. Camp Fine, as you know, chairs the Independent Community Bankers Association. He said that Dodd-Frank Dodd recognizes the two distinct sectors within the financial services spectrum, Main Street Community Banks and Wall Street Metabanks, broadly supportive of the act, doesn't agree with everything in it, but it recognizes the efforts of many people on the Hill to make sure that 
small banks were not subject to an unfair and unnecessary burden as we try to fix the big failures in the system. But I agree with you that we want to be very careful that we don't overdo it. Yeah. And I think that the bigger challenge, I, I think, uh, apart from just the uncertainty uh, facing banks and businesses across the country, is that I think examiners, there's just some, some natural tendency. These are human beings. Uh, of They want to make sure they're erring on the side of caution now, and we want to make sure they don't overcorrect. Well, but I think that as we go forward, let's just make sure, as you just said, that sweet spot, kind of like on a baseball bat, uh, we need to find that, uh, that right position as far as this regulation. Uh, next question I had is, when we look at this small business lending fund, and you just talked about how many thousands of banks we have out there, but how many are looking to or using this fund, did we really have a bottom-up process by going out, talking to the SBA, talking to some small business leaders, community banks, as far as what would you like to see us tailor this fund to be so that it could be a bottom-up process and maybe not a top-down driven process? Uh, very good question. And, you know, it, it took nine months uh, for Congress to react to the initial proposals we made and reshape them and ultimately legislate them. Nine months is a long time with a country facing this degree of uh, challenge in the financial sector. And during those nine months, uh, not just we, but uh, your predecessors and other people in the committee spent a lot of time talking to states with experience in these programs, to community banks and business about what would be the most powerful set of packages. And I'm sure we didn't get it perfect, but uh, what we all tried to do was take the best mix of things that would command the most support up here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, you're, we're trying a lot of different things. Uh, you know, Roosevelt said in the, in the Great Depression, he said, you know, if I'm not mistaken, what the country needs is, um, is bold experimentation. And we are experimenting with the best mix of things we think will help mitigate it. It's not going to make it easy for everybody caught up in this mess, but we, we thought we were taking the best mix of ideas that could command the most support up here. Okay. The uh, last thing I'll say is uh, from a lot of people down in South Florida where we still have some double-digit unemployment and incredible foreclosure problems, uh, please remember that small businesses operate as S corporations from personal income tax rates when you start talking about raising taxes. Thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, I absolutely will remember that, and, I, and I, uh, you're making a good point. Gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being with us today. Um, I have a uh, small business uh, and uh, jobs and economy roundtable in my state and in my district. And when I talk to uh, small business owners in that setting, uh, they reaffirm how important capital is, the lifeblood of small business, as you've said already. Um, in Rhode Island, where our economy has been particularly hard hit, um, small businesses, many of our small businesses do not have a strong balance sheet. They are, uh, they may be underwater in a building that they're in or in their own home and they may have impaired credit scores because of credit card debt that they have taken to keep their business running and keep their businesses open. And so with all those factors in play, even with an SBA guarantee, getting a capital infusion uh, can become be still very, very difficult for some small businesses in Rhode Island. So when I spoke recently with the president of Coastway Community Bank, which is my state's largest dollar lender of SBA loans, I was very surprised to learn that his institution is not planning to take advantage of the Small Business Loan Fund. Um, the Coastway is a mutual institution, and according to the documents that I have had the opportunity to review from Treasury, mutuals cannot issue preferred stock to Treasury without changing their tax selections. So Treasury will not offer mutuals Tier 1 capital. And so here we have instances where we have a lender, a really seasoned and experienced lender, uh, that could have borrowed $10 million from Treasury and leveraged that to between $100 and $150 million in small business loans. But instead, because of this uh, complication, they are really forced to remain on the sidelines and not participate. And so my question is, what could we do now at this stage in the SBLF program to engage these mutual institutions in this program? Uh, we know, as you said, 844 <laughs> banks have submitted applications um, seeking $11.6 billion. So there's $18 billion remaining, and if this distinction between Tier 1 and Tier 2 capital is keeping these really good, tried and tested and secure and successful uh, banks like Coastway in Rhode Island on the sidelines, what can we do, what can Treasury do now to get them in this game to really get that capital out in places like Rhode Island and in places like my congressional? I'm not sure we have a solution to this problem, just to be honest, but we'll be happy to talk to you in more detail to your staff about it. But let me explain a bit the way the, way this, the, the nature of this constraint. Uh, under the system we have today, it's the banking regulators to determine what counts as capital. 
and in their judgment for those types of institutions, they are not willing, I want to say this carefully, to count as capital uh, the capital Congress made available through this program. And that, that gives us a problem. And what it does mean is that this has limited benefit for a certain type of institutions that are structured in, in that form. But I would be happy to uh, talk to you and your staff in more detail about it and, and see if there is anything we can do about this. I am not, I'm not sure there is. I mean, it just strikes me that some of these community banks which are best positioned to do and have the preexisting relationship with small businesses are in the best position to do this kind of lending and they are prohibited, which Yeah, I, I, I completely understand what you are saying. The whole program is designed to take advantage of the knowledge community banks have about who is creditworthy and you know, it has got very good leverage in it because of the public power private partnership. Uh, but we have got this problem, which is the bank regulators do not want to or don't feel they can count as capital, tier one capital, this type of, of, of capital investment for those type of institutions. Um, and I am sure they would be happy to explain to you why they came to that judgment, and we would be happy to be part of that. Terrific. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us here today. I uh, would like to go back, actually, to your opening comment when you had stated that the President had righted the ship. Uh, and frankly, I have to tell you, in the 3rd District <clears throat> of Colorado, we have not seen the ship righted. Uh, we see unemployment at 9.1 percent. Uh, if you go the th through the 3rd Congressional District of Colorado, we have better than double-digit unemployment in many of our communities right now. Uh, we are seeing great frustration in terms of the marketplace. Uh, access to capital. I'm a small businessman. And uh, let me tell you the problems that I see and my counterparts are really seeing right now. It's actually uncertainty. You can provide the access to capital, but if we don't have sales, it doesn't work. We have to be able to get this economy moving. And the uncertainty that we're seeing, frankly, coming out of the administration is greatly impacting a lot of business decisions right now. When I read through your entire statement last night, you were talking about uh, government-run health care providing certainty. It's created uncertainty for a lot of small businesses that are out there. When we're talking about the tax code that Mr. West had referred to as well, uh, you and the President have stated that if you're in $250,000 or more in this country, you're wealthy. Uh, I'd invite you to come to Colorado with me, uh, sit down with small businesses, LLCs uh, that are working. They do not feel that they are rich because in the case of my business, and believe me, for the last few years we haven't had to worry about making those types of profits. We reinvest those back into our business to be able to keep our people employed. Uh, we're facing higher gas prices in this country. So in the entire scope of things that we're looking at right now, when we're talking about access to capital and uh, we're doing everything we can to, to state, uh, go to your comments, to make sure that we are preserving and standing up for the American taxpayer. I guess I, I would like to know, when we look back on TARP and ERA, did uh, the government actually stand up for the American taxpayer? In, in TARP? Yep. Well, let me come back to where you started, because uh, you are absolutely right that unemployment nationally is roughly 9 percent, but that doesn't capture much higher unemployment rates in many parts of the country. And you are absolutely right that this is still a very tough economy, and we have got a long way to go to dig out of and repair the mess, the damage caused by the crisis. So I, I don't disagree with you on that. And I ab absolutely agree that, again, small businesses in many parts of the country, parts of the country where unemployment is very high or businesses that were in construction, real estate, uh, are, still, um, are still showing the deep scars caused by the crisis. The question is, how, what can we do to help make that better? Now, you referred to the uh, a tax question. I just want to make sure I respond to that because I, I know that is a, a broad concern. So I want to explain to me what our, what our view is about that, that particular question. What we proposed is, is to allow the tax rates uh, that affect individuals and businesses that, that, are, that pay taxes as pass-throughs um, who make more than $250,000 to have those rates revert to the level they were at the end of the Clinton administration. And we don't do that because we think it's uh, that we want to do it in particular. We do it because we have huge fiscal challenges as a country, and we have to figure out a way to dig out of that mess. And we think the best way to do that for the economy is through a broader, balanced approach with savings matched by some modest changes in revenues. Now, you're right um, that that will change the tax treatment of small businesses, but only roughly 3 percent of small businesses. And 
And uh, we think that is a reasonable strategy given the broad challenges we face. And we are just restoring to the rates that prevailed at the end of the Clinton administration, which was a period of very good small business performance, very strong investment growth, very strong income growth, very strong employment growth, very strong productivity growth. And we think the economy uh, can handle it. And, you know, it is about alternatives. If we don't do that, you know, if we extend those tax rates for the top 2 percent, uh, then we have to go out and borrow $700 billion over the next 10 years. We can't afford to do that, and that is why we have proposed that. Well, I understand that. And I, I just might throw out the suggestion, if we get people back to work, we are creating new taxpayers. And one way I can assure you that we will not be getting people back to work is you can dismiss only 3 percent. Those are job creators, people that are creating jobs, and, and we have got struggling people right now that cannot meet those mortgages. But if we go back a little bit to uh, some of the, the issues that we are really seeing on the banking end of the world, Colorado Bankers Association notes that we are going to have 25,000 pages, potentially, of new regulations coming out of Dodd-Frank. Uh, these are going to impact it. When we look through the five C's uh, in terms of making those actual loans uh, to small businesses in this country, uh, the banks want to be able to loan this money, uh, but the regulators, uh, regulations, again, are coming into play, choking off the American economy and our ability to be able to create jobs. I don't agree with that, but uh, explain, let, me, let me explain a little bit why I think it is a fair approach to thinking about that. And I, 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 as I said again, it is very important we get this balance right. And there is no perfect way to get that balance right. But remember, look back at what happened, given the basic failures of oversight in our financial system. It caused a huge amount of damage to small businesses. They were the innocent victims, in many ways, of the big mistakes in design of regulation, checks and balances of our financial system. It was catastrophic. So we have to figure out a way to fix that mess. And those regulations are overwhelmingly targeted, not at small banks, at the large institutions the derivatives markets, the complex aspects of our financial system where most of the trauma was. was and it, these are complicated problems and they require complicated solutions. But the law was designed very carefully because of the efforts of many of the people in this body to make sure that those burdens did not fall on uh, small banks. And we have got to make sure we have a system that provides more stability, more stability and access to credit, and that is what those rules are designed to do. But, of course, you are right to say we have got to be careful to get the balance right and not overdo it. <clears throat> the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu. Um, last year, the Congressional Asian Pacific Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus teamed up to offer an amendment to the Small Business Lending Fund legislation that would make sure culturally and linguistically appropriate services are part of the financial institution's lending plan where appropriate. And of course, we did this to ensure that there is greater success for the program and that the funds go where they are needed. Uh, what criteria have you set up to decide whether or not businesses will have to institute culturally and linguistically appropriate lending plans? Congressman, I'm going to have to uh, I'm going to have to consult with my staff and come back to you in writing with a more detailed response to that. But I I I know the provision you're referring to. The objective is something we share. I think it's very important. We've worked very hard to do much more extensive outreach across the country to make sure people are aware of these programs can take advantage of them. We're committed to continuing that, and we're happy to work with you on how best to do that. And I'll be happy to report in more detail on exactly how we're what we're doing with that provision. I would appreciate that. Um, I'm also very interested in the establishment of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion at Treasury and uh, at other fi federal financial regulatory agencies. Um, our minority communities face many cultural and linguistic uh, barriers that are often tackled by community-based organizations, our CBOs. Uh, the CBOs are the link to these communities that often don't know about federal government programs or understand how to navigate the federal process. Uh, it's important that this new Office of Minority and Women Affairs overcome these barriers and without significant expertise in community affairs uh, in the office, uh, we are concerned about, about the effectiveness of the outreach program. Can you give me a status update on the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of Offices in the Department of Treasury? Uh, absolutely. I think you are right to point out the challenge, and you are right to say it requires people in these jobs who have a better feel for what is happening in those communities. And uh, as, as I think you know, we, we appointed Dr. Lorraine Cole to take this job at Treasury in February this year. Uh, she is excellent, great, great record of accomplishment in this area. And 
if you had another chance, I think you should, you should spend some time with her, and she'd be happy to give you an update on exactly where the, where she is, what she's doing, where the opportunities are, where the challenges are. Uh, to what extent has this office been active in reaching out to minority-owned banks, um, uh, where there is or banks where there's a high concentration of minority businesses, so that they can promote the small business lending fund? Well, the the entire uh, complement of people at Treasury responsible for these programs have been doing a huge amount of outreach to small banks across the country, uh, and she will play a meaningful role in that, but that's a broader department-wide priority. It's not just a burden we place on her. Okay. Well, uh, switching uh, topics, uh, let me ask about the uh, State Small Business Credit Initiative. Uh, this um, is a program that uh, uh, is building upon successful models of state small business programs, and I know California received $169 million through this program. Uh, how successful has this program been in increasing lending to small businesses in California? Well, I think to be fair, it's a little too early to tell. Um, but again, the basic rationale for this program is you had across the country a lot of state programs with a pretty good record of creative, innovative ways to help small businesses get credit. And we, we, we made the judgment with Congress that as a complement to what we did directly with banks using their expertise, we take advantage of these credit programs, and California is one example of that. But we've now approved 10 states for, um, for funds through this program. We have other applications coming. We expect to reach a bunch more. But it's going to take us a little bit more time to judge the actual results. Why aren't more states applying for these funds? Uh, well, as I said, we've had 17 apply. We've had a many more express interest. Uh, and, you know, we leave that judgment to them. I, and many of them may have felt that they didn't need the additional assistance, or many that may have felt that they couldn't match their programs to the requirements in the law. It's hard to know, but we, we think we'll reach a significant number of states. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary, thank you for uh, being with us today. I know you've got a busy schedule. Um, I can guarantee you of very few things in life, uh, but I can guarantee you, I wish I could guarantee you of more, but I can guarantee you if you and I took a day and we spent the afternoon in my 8th district of Illinois and we randomly, just randomly knocked on the doors of 30, 40, 50, 20 small business men and women in my district. I can guarantee you they'd all say the same thing. Uh, the uncertainty is killing them. They see their government pass a piece of health care legislation that their government doesn't even seem to know what, will what it will cost. How are they expected to factor it in? Um, they're feeling overregulated. And they're feeling that there's huge trepidation about regulations they see coming down the pike. I can guarantee you if you and I knocked in my district on the doors of five small and community banks or ten, they'd all say the same thing. Government regulations are tying our hands. That's why we're not able to lend. Um, I, I, I love listening to you. Uh, I always learn something when I listen to you. Um, but is it at all possible that all of those businessmen and women in my district and those bankers, uh, are, are, they, are they all misguided when they say they're overregulated, they're scared, there's uncertainty, and everything, and again, I, I, let me just be pointed here as I close, everything they see coming out of this administration adds to their uncertainty and their fear. To well, all of them. I, I don't, uh, I think I have a slightly different perspective, um, but I'll, I'll tell you my view. A absolutely, businesses, small businesses, are more uncertain about the future than they would have if you asked them the question in 2005. Absolutely. And the biggest uh, concern they have, and the one they talk about the most, and this is what all the surveys say, not our surveys, is say their uncertainty is about how much demand for their products is going to grow. They put that at the top of the list. That's been true for years now. And that makes sense. It's sort of a natural thing because they're not going to invest or hire unless they have more confidence about what, what, what rate of growth and demand for their products are going to be. And even though we've had 18 months of growth, uh, people understandably, given the pressures you're seeing in the economy today, 
gas prices, uh, weather, Japan, a little concern about Europe, uh, you see a few more headwinds now. So that is understandable. Now, it is also true that businesses always uh, want less regulation, understandable, and banks um, would like to operate with less regulation. There is nothing unique in that. But nothing no, understandable, but is it correct? Well, um, I think what is correct is that we have to be very careful, given the trauma caused by the financial crisis, to make sure that we have a financial system that is more conservatively managed. And I do not believe uh, there is really a meaningful risk for small banks that Dodd-Frank itself is going to add to their regulatory burden. I think there is some risk, as I said, that examiners are going to overdo it a bit, maybe a little too cautious, tighten up a bit. And that is something that I think uh, the chairman of the Fed, the chairman of the FDIC, other bank regulators are trying to lean against carefully, so there is more balance in that. But where there is concern about, uh, about people overdoing the regulatory side, we will take a careful look at that. Uh, but that is the way I would see it. And you know, I, I know I haven't spent the time in your district, but I spent a lot of time talking to people. And they say similar things. They say banks say we are not lending because we are regulators, um, which they often say. Uh, and we see businesses say we are more uncertain. And I don't think that is surprising, given, given what this country has just so, been through. So so how do we give them certainty? Well, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. And I, and I think that uh, just to speak to the issue of the day, I think it would be very helpful for Washington to come to agreement on a long-term fiscal consolidation plan, you know, a, you know, a reasonably growth-friendly fiscal consolidation plan, because I think that would demonstrate that the country has the capacity, country's leaders in Washington have the capacity to try to make some progress in solving a long-term problem that is a bit of a cloud on the country. I mean, just to be honest about it. I hear all the time from folks that, look, this, this recession, this crisis wasn't the President's. It was there when he came into office. This recovery is his. When you look at this recovery in historical perspective, and I know I'm running out of time, so you've got to be brief, we are not nearly where we need to be at when it comes to this recovery. I agree with you about that. But, uh, but I think this is an important question, Mr. Chairman. Can I just spend a minute on, on this issue? Because I think it's at the center of this big debate we're having about the country, and it's very important to understand that so as we think about what we can do about it. And I think it is important to recognize that you had a crisis caused by a country that was living beyond its means, too much leverage in the banking system, people across the country borrowing way beyond their means. And when you have a crisis caused by that, then recoveries are necessarily unavoidably slower. And why is that? When you build too many houses, you can have a long period where construction is weak. When, country, when people have to reduce the amount of debt they have to be, feel more secure about the future, they are going to spend less, be more cautious. When banks have to delever, so those, are, those create headwinds for the recovery that consign us to more moderate recoveries than we would normally have. Much more, much more modest recovery is, uh, is the reality we face today. The question is, how can we make it stronger? How can we make it better? And I think we can do things on the tax side by expanding exports, by doing a sensibly designed long-term fiscal plan, by being careful about the balance and regulations, we can improve the odds that we get more people back as quickly as we can. But most of what we are living today as a country now is the effects of those mistakes we made up in the run-up to the crisis. And if you look outside construction, you look beyond the banking system, you look beyond the sectors most directly affected by people being a little more uh, careful about how they spend and borrow, the rest of the American economy, if you look at export performance, private investment growth, productivity growth, agriculture, manufacturing, high tech, this is a very resilient, very productive, very innovative uh, economy. And we have a very good chance, we make some sensible judgments coming out of this, to emerge from this crisis stronger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Secretary, for uh, being here. Uh, in anticipation of, of this hearing, I, I did reach out to my local community banks and businesses to just get in a sense of what they would like to <clears throat> hear and get answers to, one of which I think we have talked about uh, for a while. However, I would like to just uh, ask the question again and, and get as concise answers as, as possible so I can make notes and give them the answer. And uh, particularly, some of the banks applied for the SBLF on the first day, and they still have 
yet to hear any type of uh, response, and I heard you say that there, there are numerous steps. But their question uh, is, can you give a uh, timeline, best of your knowledge, or if you have to get it back to me, that's fine, on when these banks should start uh, hearing uh, their, uh, their fate in the program? Uh, relatively soon, as I said, we've had about 850 banks apply. The first step they have to go through is they have to go through the primary regulators. We only see the applications, or we only look at applications after they make through that process. That process is taking longer than I think anybody expected, but we're moving as quickly as we can. But remember, we have an obligation to be careful, mm -hmm. uh, careful with the taxpayers' money. So we'll give people as quick a response as we can. Uh, and just to follow up on that, something that may help is to let us know how many have been through that first phase of the of the regulators and are now sitting in uh, Treasury. can't tell you that now, um, but we're not the uh, meaningful source of delay. Okay. Uh, if you can give me that information, that would certainly help. The second question posed from uh, the bankers was uh, that, especially in Louisiana, we continue to lose our local and community-based banks because of mergers and acquisitions by larger banks. And <clears throat> following the financial crisis, the bigger banks are only getting bigger. Knowing community banks are the engines of entrepreneurship in their local communities, what is Treasury doing to affirmatively support the local banks and to help them grow and sustain themselves? Uh, a very important question. You're right to say that uh, one of the great strengths of our system, and we intend to preserve it, is that we have a system uh, with, I think, more than 8,000 banks, community banks, operating alongside the large institutions. And that's a great strength of our system. It makes the um, the system more stable, more resilient, more responsive to the needs of Main Street businesses. We, we intend to preserve that. The two most important things we can do about that are, one, make sure that we help these programs to provide capital to banks, reach as many institutions as possible. And the second is to make sure that as we reform our financial system, we are putting the bulk of the burden for reform on the large institutions that took the most risk, whose failure caused the most damage. And so as just to give you two examples, uh, we are putting higher capital requirements on the large institutions relative to the risks they take, relative to small banks, and we are making sure that large banks, not small banks, bear most of the cost of solving future crises. Those are just two examples, uh, and, but again, we are committed, as are you, to try to make sure we preserve a system with this great strength of thousands of institutions that, that uh, operate in these communities and can better meet the needs of their Main Street customers. And, and just shifting a little bit from community banks, uh, my experience in Louisiana, especially in, in watching our small business growth and actually some very good uh, results with the New Market Tax Credit Program, part of my question would be to maybe gauge uh, the administration's view of the success of new markets and, and what, what can we expect in the future in terms of new market, which is a very creative way to put equity investments into uh, communities to create jobs. You, you're right. It's a, it's a great program. It's had a lot of bipartisan support over a long period of time. A very good record everybody can look at um, for impact. Uh, and the, the main thing that we're looking at now is try to make sure we can uh, enhance the program so that more of the incentives go directly to small businesses that aren't uh, directly in the real estate business. Uh, and we think we can do that. We've got some suggestions how to do that. Happy to, uh, happy to have my colleagues brief you in more detail on what we think is possible there. And uh, my last uh, 30 seconds, I'll just make a quick comment, which is to, uh, as best as we can, to continue to help those small businesses, especially as the administration will come to us and present uh, at maybe three trade bills to us, to make sure that our small businesses can compete, to make sure that they can get their products and their goods to market and all of those things so that they can be competitive. And I will end with my last plug as always. We can't get our goods to market unless we dredge the Mississippi River. Sixty percent of all grain in this country comes through the Mississippi River. There was 800-foot ship stuck in the middle of the Mississippi for two days a couple weeks ago. So we have to do that if we're going to be serious about doubling exports and uh, getting our goods to market. So thank you again for coming in, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you. I agree. Exports and infrastructure are a very important part of our long-term growth strategy. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Richmond. Now we have to turn to another member from Louisiana, uh, Mr. Landry. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Guyton, if I <clears throat> ask you a question that you um, answered already, I apologize. I had to go to a committee to vote. Um, 
you know, it, it's frustrating on, on our end because I hear your comments that, you know, you tried to place the majority of the burden on the larger banks uh, because it seems like they were uh, more at fault as to this meltdown. But yet I don't hear them crying as much as I do the community banks. Why, why don't we just waive the community banks from Dodd-Frank? And then if that is the case, then we could allow the community banks to go back to – uh, to be in community banks because they, they're crying more than the, than the larger banks uh, un, under uh, this bill. So how can how can that be if what you're saying is we try to place more burden on the on the big banks than the small banks? What Dot Dot Frank did largely, not completely, but did largely leave small banks out of it. Uh, but I think if you listen carefully, the large banks are complaining much louder. They're spending a huge amount of money trying to undo, shift the burden, delay the reforms that are targeted at them and their risk-taking. They're spending a huge amount of money trying to block, delay, erode, weaken, walk back. And I think it's important to small businesses, to businesses and small banks, that, that you guys don't let that happen. Because, again, why would you want to put the country through what we went through in this crisis uh, where so many innocent victims were left bearing the consequences of um, a lot of mistakes they weren't part of. Well, look, I'm with you. I'm, I, I'm trying to protect our community banks. And, and it leads me into the next question. Um, you know, I, I was I, I started several businesses, one of them, the first one, actually uh, using an SBA loan. And I was always under the impression that SBA loans were kind of a bridge to help the, the little guy out there when the other banks – uh, weren't able to or didn't want to lend to them. But yet my community banks are telling me that now, in fact, I had a real-life e example of where there, were, there was an application by uh, a business owner uh, to invest in a business, and he had great credit. He had plenty of collateral, uh, but the examiners wouldn't allow the community bank to, uh, to make the loan because they felt that his business plan um, – he couldn't prove that his business plan could continue to pay the note. Well, if that was the case, a lot of us would ne I, I would have never been able to start my business. And, but yet he was able to, to get a loan through small business. And what concerns me is that here we have the private market willing to take the risk, but yet we're moving them to the taxpayer uh, uh, who is going to take the risk when the private market would gladly take the risk. And, and they're, they're pinning that. On, on, on the regulators. Why would that be? I mean, is that the effect uh, that y'all guys would I don't, like? I don't think so, and I, I agree with you. I, I, and, I, um, and I think that you're right that the challenge in this is you have to figure out how to put out a financial fire, make sure you open up the credit channels again when they're stuck because of a crisis, but do so without creating more dependency on the government over the long run or crowding out uh, private markets from financing. I think we've actually been very, very successful at doing that in the financial system as a whole. And the terms of these loans, these, these programs, are established in a way where as conditions improve, as people are willing to take more risk, as the private markets come back, then it will not be economically attractive or sensible for banks to rely on the government for these programs. So, so you say in that example should not have happened. Well, I, I don't. Again, in a, in, a, in a crisis for a temporary period of time when the markets freeze up and private investors pull back. But, but this was like in the, the last yeah, so six I, months. I think, I think now you should see the balance shifting. And you're right. I think your point is we should not create a system where government programs are crowding out private capital from financing that. Absolutely. And I don't think that we face a meaningful risk of that. Uh, I don't think we do. Uh, as long as sure. I have your commitment that that's not what y'all trying. To Absolutely do. not. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Guy. I yield back. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Critz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Sec Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, talking about the SBLF, uh, launched in December 20th of uh, last year. As of June 20th of this year, you have 869 applications for approximately 11.6 billion in funding. There's 30 billion available. Is it succeeding? Is that where you think it ought to be? Are there issues that we need to review, or that uh, you can help to get that money into the economy? Well, uh, as I said at the beginning several times, I think the we're a little behind what we thought was the realistic schedule at the beginning, and that's because 
it's taking longer to put in place the checks and balances to determine eligibility. In, the, in our system, those checks and balances to protect the taxpayer depend on two steps. One is a review by regulators. That is taking longer than we thought. But um, as I said, we're th we think we are going to reach a meaningful number of institutions and make a meaningful difference in their capacity to lend. And I think we are largely going to achieve the basic objectives of the Act. You can't be sure at this stage because it is still early days. So, so the, the delay caused a uh, the reason I guess I am going is I would have thought that banks would have been out there they would have seen this passed and would have been sending applications in. Oh, yeah. They, they came, and they came in numbers, in the hundreds. Uh, Which isn't but, a big number. Well, actually, I think it is a pretty big number. Okay. Uh, I think it is a pretty big number because, you know, uh, it is true we have 8,000 banks, but um, many won't be eligible. Many of them are fine on their own. So I, I don't think it is a, uh, a surprisingly small number. Well, the thing that I find interesting about it, though, is that, um, you know, the dividend that the the banks will pay to Treasury goes down as they lend more to small business. So it is a huge incentive. And I just can't imagine, we have been talking about, we know, and, and I don't think there is a, this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. I think we all have small businesses that are looking for credit and having a hard time finding it. So this program seems so perfect for that opportunity. And well, I agree. I think it is a well designed program, pretty powerful incentive. Uh, and, you know, again, I can't be sure why it's 800, not 2,000, but I don't think it's that surprising. Again, because you have a lot of institutions that feel fine on their own and you know don't want to do business with the government. And frankly, I don't. Uh, I think that's real reasonable. You want you want people to be reluctant to come to the government. <laughs> and right. We like these programs to reach as many institutions, but we can't force them to come. Right. Well, and that brings me to my next point, which is, uh, I guess it's a, a statistic, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's accurate, is about 38 percent, or no, 59 percent of the funds requested are from institutions that took TARP money, and they're trying to convert that money. Now, That's is right. that, are we defeating the process by converting TARP money to this? is I mean, this is, really wasn't to, to do that. Well, no, it, it actually was designed to do that. Congress okay. chewed over that and thought about it a lot and decided that was a good thing to do. And the reason why they reached that judgment, and I agree with that judgment, is there are just two reasons. One is because of the reasons you said, uh, this is a, we think, pretty well-designed way to create incentives for more lending. So we think it is more bang for the buck in terms of lending than the additional the original capital programs. Okay. So we think that's a good reason why you should let them refinance. The other reason is just a fairness question. You know, why should you penalize institutions that took the initiative to apply for the initial capital program? Congress introduces a new program. It's more economically attractive. Why would you penalize them for coming early? Okay. All right. Well, and you had mentioned um, earlier about uh, housing, the construction, small businesses, and construction took a huge hit. And I had my staff run some numbers that. Uh, uh, Home Depot's fourth quarter profits were up 72 percent. Uh, Lowe's, which is more of a home person, uh, Home Depot does a lot of individual, but a lot of uh, uh, small construction companies. Uh, Lowe's was down a bit, and then 84 Lumber, which is one in my district. Uh, of course, they're much smaller than they were in '05, uh, about a third of what they used to be. Uh, but it seems like there is some activity there. Although, when calling the halls the union halls back home. I know I got a lot of people that are still laid off and we're in prime construction season. So, uh, you know, this housing issue is is going to drag on our economy for quite some time. And, and and are there things that we should be reviewing as a committee that we can help jumpstart or help get that housing inventory off the market? I, I think you're right. Housing is still very tough. Uh, there's some signs of light in some parts of the country, but, you know, with unemployment, so high, uh, it is not that surprising. You still have such a large imbalance between homes out there and demand for new homes. And that is going to take, realistically, several more years to work through. Uh, we think the three most promising things you can do about that uh, are, first, and this is overwhelmingly the most important one, is to make sure growth is stronger, uh, more people back to work, incomes growing again. That is the most important thing we can do. And everything we do here and, and you do in Congress should be governed by that basic simple objective. Housing specifically, uh, we are trying to make sure that we uh, bring this broader global settlement effort to improve the foreclosure process down to earth on sensible terms, reduce some uncertainty. And we have a, we're trying very hard to make sure through the full complement of housing programs we have 
through HUD, HFA, and uh, the ones authorized by Congress for the Treasury, that they reach as many people as they can. They've helped uh, set a new standard for modifications that have helped two to three million Americans stay in their homes who can afford to stay in their homes, but they can't reach everybody, but we want to make sure they reach as many people as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Elmer. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Secretary Geithner, for being here today. Um, Mr. Secretary, I have listened to all of your testimony, and um, especially your last few statements there. Obviously, the answer to our economic problem here in this country is jobs. We have got to get businesses hiring again. Now, you, in your initial comments, uh, kind of painted a pretty um, rosy picture, certainly much rosier than what we see back in North Carolina or in the second district of North Carolina. You said 15 straight months of economic growth with uh, about a million jobs created over the last six months, and yet we are sustained at above 9 percent unemployment for over 23 months. Overwhelmingly, the businesses back home and across the country continue to tell us that regulation, lack of access to capital, taxation, fear of taxation, and just the overwhelming uncertainty that our businesses face is what's keeping them from hiring. They just simply cannot. They have cut everything they can cut. Our households have cut everything that we can cut. And yet, we're talking about doing some things in the future. Right now, we're at a standstill with the, with the lending. We have no guarantee, and you, as you have stated, you have no ability to tell us when that will occur, especially with the small business um, loan program. Looking into the future, you are supporting the idea of taxation, increasing taxes on those who make $250,000 or more. Those are our business owners. Those are they're three percent of your business owners. Three percent of your small businesses. Sixty-four percent of small businesses. Sixty-four percent of jobs that are created in this country are for the small businesses. No, that's right. I agree with that. But but um, but just to put it in perspective, and it's important to recognize why are we doing this? You know, our deficits are ten percent of GDP, higher than they've been since any time in the post-war period, really. We have a big hole to dig out of, and we have to figure out how to do that in a way that's balanced, good for growth, fair to people as a whole. We're not doing it because we want to do it. We're doing so, it because if we don't do it, then again, I have to go out and borrow a trillion dollars over the next 10 years to finance those tax benefits for the top 2 percent. And I don't think I can justify doing that. And if we were to cut spending by that magnitude to do it, you would be putting a huge additional burden on the economy, probably greater negative economic impact than that modest change in revenues. So that's, then, that's then why. Then what, what is the goal of the tax? You, you stated it's only 3 percent. Okay. Only 3 percent of small businesses. What is, what is the goal, then, in increasing the taxes? Well, no, the, the goal is that, uh, and, I, th and I'm, I know you and your colleagues understand this and you care about it deeply, we are living with unsustainable deficits. Yes. They, if we do not address them, they will hurt economic growth and investment in the United States. But if, if as you stated, only 3 percent of small businesses will be affected, how can that increase in taxation be that significant to turn that around? Well, you are making our case. The, the point is we're not, we're, not we doing, we're, not doing, we're not doing it because we want to do it. We are doing it because we see no alternative to a balanced approach to reduce our fiscal deficits. And, uh, again, if you don't, I think what the House passed demonstrates this, if you don't touch revenues and you leave in place the tax cuts for the top 2 percent that were put in place by President Bush, if you leave those in place and you are trying to bring our deficits down over time, then you have to do exceptionally deep cuts in benefits for middle-class Americans and you have to shrink the overall size of government programs and things like education to levels that we could not accept as a country. And so to do a balanced approach to reduce our deficits, you have to make modest changes in revenues. There is no realistic opportunity to do uh, alternative to doing that. But, you know, we have to be careful how we do it. Okay. I would like to reclaim my time for a moment. You, we, we all agree jobs are the answer, and yet you are willing and, and more than capable of, of putting that excessive burden, which we already know from our small business owners, is the issue. Why would we go and why would we do more? Why would we harm them more? Why would we create more uncertainty in the private sector? We, 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 I don't, I'm not sure we disagree fundamentally. 
the economy needs to grow to create jobs. Our basic challenge is try to figure out how to make growth faster, more sustainable, translate to more jobs. Part of that is expanding exports. Part of it is making sure that we are investing in infrastructure, education, things that matter to our strength. And part of it is a balanced, growth-friendly approach to deficit reduction over time. Because if we don't fix that problem, you will leave a broader cloud in the economy longer term. But we have to be careful how we do it so we don't hurt the economy. Well, Mr. Secretary, I would just like to close by saying that on behalf of the business owners in North Carolina and across this country, you are wrong. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Secretary uh, Geithner, for being here. And, uh, and I want to uh, take a moment before I ask a couple of questions uh, to tell you uh, where you are right. Uh, in fact, uh, I had the opportunity yesterday before I flew in uh, to uh, Washington to be at a groundbreaking for a new Chrysler facility. I represent uh, Michigan. In fact, uh, Chrysler is headquartered uh, in my district. But I was at a groundbreaking for a, a new factory, a new paint shop, an $850 million investment uh, in that plant, uh, which is about 2,200 jobs just in that plant. And as you know, uh, as well as anybody, those 2,200 jobs uh, translate into a lot of other jobs uh, throughout the economy, not just the auto suppliers, but all of the small businesses that are located uh, through there. And uh, I'm a relatively new member of Congress. I came in in 2009 at the height of the financial crisis. Uh, I remember sitting in the boardroom with Mr. Nardelli, who was the CEO of Chrysler at the time, uh, who said in uh, very explicit terms that uh, if uh, there isn't assistance for Chrysler as they go through bankruptcy because of the credit markets that had basically seized up because of what had happened, uh, the fiasco on Wall Street, there simply wasn't money available for a company the size of Chrysler or General Motors to get through bankruptcy. They needed access to funds. Uh, he said very clearly that they would go into liquidation. This company would just close, liquidate, sell everything off. And I was sitting in Chrysler headquarters, which is the second largest building in the country next to the Pentagon. And that building would have been shuttered. Thousands of people would have been laid off. Grass would have been growing in the parking lot. Uh, that money was necessary. The President did a very courageous thing, took a lot of heat from a lot of people around this country. You took a lot of heat from people around the country, uh, made that investment. And now fast forward two years, that building, actually has run out of space. They are going to be hiring an additional 1,000 engineers. They can't put them all in that building. They are looking for additional real estate, additional jobs in the community. And they, Chrysler has announced, as you know, paid off uh, the money from the taxpayers uh, with interest. Uh, it is a, an incredible success story. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for believing in American workers. Thank you for believing in the American middle class, because those are jobs that we are seeing, not just in Michigan. Those are jobs throughout the country, through suppliers all through the country, through auto dealers. Our auto dealers, uh, many of them would have been closed. They would have been closed had that company liquidated. And those are important small businesses in every one of our congressional districts uh, that would have disappeared. So that was uh, a courageous thing to do. Thank you for doing that. It is a great success story. Uh, now we need to continue to build on that success, continue to build uh, on those jobs. And as you know, it is certainly something that uh, I have worked a, a great deal on with small business lending in particular, with my work on the Financial Services Committee. And one uh, area that I worked uh, in particular with was with Gene Sperling, uh, who is now with the White House uh, Economic Council, and that is on the uh, State Small Business Credit Initiative, which we have heard uh, you have had some questions uh, from folks uh, on that. And I wanted to just put in the record uh, some of the successes with that state uh, Small Business Credit Initiative. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you should have a letter uh, that was uh, submitted uh, by our governor in Michigan, uh, Governor Snyder. I would like to have that uh, letter uh, entered into the permanent record. Uh, the uh, Small Business Credit Initiative is really modeled after what we are doing in Michigan, what we have been doing in Michigan for a number of years, which is a collateral support program uh, that has been particularly helpful right now to these smaller auto suppliers as the auto industry is recovering. And yet a lot of those uh, smaller auto suppliers are in a situation where their factories are worth uh, considerably less than they were, so they can't get uh, loans that they needed. But this program, which was a bipartisan effort, it was started by Governor Granholm, a Democrat, and it has now continued to be supported by Governor Rick Snyder, who is a Republican. And in the letter that I have entered into the record, he talks about the very successful experience that we have had in the State of Michigan. Uh, that, that Michigan has not experienced since they started the program in 2009, not a single loss, and I am quoting here, while generating nearly $200 million in private loans uh, with a very small public investment. It is a good investment that is leveraged uh, considerably. Now, I know these uh, programs um, uh, are you're starting to get these applications uh, and, uh, and you are approving them, but I would expect, because of the success we have had in Michigan and other states, that 
Uh, this is something that should gear up fairly quickly because of the experiences we have. What is your, uh, your expectation now that that is uh, occurring, applications are continuing to come in? Is this a program where we are going to get fairly quick results, particularly relative to other components uh, of the Act? Uh, I think so. It depends, of course, on how, how quickly the states are able to put the money to work. But I think in California and North Carolina, they are already making loans. Uh, Missouri's fund has already been uh, oversubscribed with 55 applications. So I think the speed will depend on how quickly the states can put their money to work. But uh, I think you are right to um, point out the benefits of it. And again, the basic insight we adopted with support of you and many others is to work with the grain of established programs that have a good record of doing these things carefully, and, and that is the promise of the program. Right. And, and I appreciate effort. And, Mr. Chairman, I have a, another letter just in closing uh, from the Michigan Credit Union League. Uh, we also had credit unions and other institutions that have participated and have seen this program as a success in the past and looking forward to for the additional resources. But thank you for your work, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. <clears throat> Gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just comment in listening to the last presentation that um, an additional 1,000 engineers and the success of Chrysler, I bet the secured creditors who had their assets confiscated in the Chapter 11 filings have also been made whole and who had their assets restored and received their dividend checks and that the shares that have been handed to the unions have been handed over to their rightful owners. I don't think any of that happened. And uh, that is the other side of the story from the gentleman's comments. But, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, aside from those disagreements we might have here on the panel, I am just I'm curious about some things to lay down a foundation. And when I listen to you speak, and I appreciate your testimony, I don't hear things I disagree with. Um, and, I, and often your analysis is accurate in the, within the, at least the scope of what you are talking about. So I just a couple of questions to help me illuminate your philosophy. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rank? How would you rank Milton Friedman? That's an interesting question. You know, I'm not an economist, not a trained, credentialed economist. Um, so I'd say I probably agree on a lot of his things, but not on everything. Wouldn't put a number to that. No, I wouldn't do that. Would you put a number to John Maynard Keynes? No, I wouldn't do that either. I'd say the sort of same thing, which is um, no, uh, no perfect guide in either uh, to the challenges facing the country, but things we can draw from both. Adam Smith. I'm not, I'm not going to give you a number. I'll say the same thing to you, no matter what. You know, again, yeah, I'm just I'm a little surprised because I, I would look at you and I think this is a man that's a complete expert on all three of these individuals uh, who has a get the wrong guy, an intuitive and intellect and a gut understanding of the flow of market capitalism globally and historically going back a couple of hundred years plus. I, I do expect you to have that basis of knowledge. And I, I, I am a student of um, financial crises, unfortunately, but, uh, but not a credential economist. Uh, you know, the philosophy I break is a much more pragmatic test. What's going to work? Okay, Ultimately, good. that's what matters. Then uh, I am interested in what's going to work as well. And um, we discussed the burdens of, uh, of regulation on business in here, primarily small business. And um, there are a few things that stick in my mind, having uh, founded and operated a small business for not quite 29 years, and uh, it's a second-generation business today. And uh, I would list um, three of the top regulated, regula regulation burdens, which we have discussed, uh, as a small businessman by trade. And I would list them IRS, Obamacare, Dodd-Frank. Can you come up with any, any, any uh, regulations or any proposals that are heavier, a heavier burden on small business than those three? <laughs> That's an interesting way to frame your question. Uh, but I would take a different approach. Uh, the tax burden on small businesses, as I said at the beginning, is lower today when the President took office. Now, you are right. Congress is now debating what should happen to tax policy in the country as we try to dig out our, out our deficits. And we are going to have to figure out a way to do that that is fair to the American people, that can be passed by the Congress, that is good for future growth. And people disagree on that. The country is very divided on that. But the tax burden today is lower than when the President took office. We have already discussed the financial system at some length. Uh, I know a fair amount about that. And again, I would say is how good was it for small business across the country that they were left with this amount of damage caused by a failed financial system, something we have to fix. And again, the bulk of that law is not directed at raising burdens on small, on small banks. Secretary, That's important to avoid. Let me, let me just inject into this. And in your earlier testimony, you talked about uh, the crisis was caused, uh, at least in part, by a country living beyond its means. And I agree with that. And that uh, we have overbuilt in housing. And I agree with that. And um, I, I would ask, though, that the solution for that appeared to be 
TARP, economic stimulus plan, increasing a lot of government spending, and now we have a government that's living beyond its means. It seems as though, from sitting here as a member of Congress and a small businessman, that the solution for the problem is the, is, is, the, is to apply to the federal government the same problem that small business had. In other words, we have overspent with government, we live beyond its means, but now I, I believe I heard some reference to you in that, that if you have that kind of a solution, it delays the recovery because we have to pay interest in principle. Some concept along that line is not your word, certainly. Well, l let me tr tell you how I approach this. Um, you know, again, we have unsustainable deficits long term, uh, short term. They are a product of a bunch of decisions made the last decade. Uh, the product of the recession, and the principal driver of the long run is that Americans are living longer, aging, health care is very expensive. Now, if we don't address that, then investment will be lower, growth will be weaker, interest rates will be higher, the economy will be burdened by that. We do agree with that. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. I agree with that, but, but when you apply the federal government's debt, and is it the same concept of the equation as a business that is over leveraged? A little different in the sense that um, you know, governments are not a business, not a family. Uh, and in, in financial crises and recessions, lesson of history is that when the markets pull back, private sector pulls back, the government has to step in temporarily, but only temporarily. And very important to make it's sure the government pulls back as it is now, as it's now doing. And the government is starting to pull back now. That is slowing growth a little bit. So you want to be careful not to overdo it. But the key lesson should be for us is the composition of these reforms on the budget side have to be designed in a way that they don't hurt growth short term and long run. That's why we believe you have to have some balance. If I could ask unanimous consent for just an additional question. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just, um, and again, your, your testimony is interesting to me, Mr. Secretary. And, and one of the things that you said was Roosevelt said that uh, one thing we need is bold experimentation. And uh, I recall a statement made to us by the President, and a date was February 10, 2009, in speaking to a Republican conference when he said that, the, um, that Franklin Delano Roosevelt's um, New Deal actually did work and uh, that the problem was that he lost his nerve in the second half of the 30s and got concerned about spending too much money, and he pulled back, which brought about a recession within a depression. Unemployment went up. And then along came World War II, the largest economic stimulus plan ever. That's almost verbatim. It's, it's conceptually exact. And so I'm wondering if uh, it, what you think of this bold experiment of President Obama's that seems to be committed to be substantially more bold than that of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I, I, don't, I, I of course, I work for this president, and I believe in everything he's doing, but I wouldn't quite compare it that way. When I, when I, I was using that phrase to refer to the range of things we had to do to fix the financial system, put out the financial fire, and you know we did exceptional things no one would ever want to do, would never want to do again ever. And the things we're doing in the credit side, capital side, are very creative, no precedent for it, and they require new approaches in that kind of. That's what I was referring to. Well, I like audacity when you're right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Owens. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Geithner, for coming today. Um, as I listen to your testimony and listen to the questions from the floor, um, one thing seems to reach out to us, and that is that demand is really the key, both in terms of product, uh, that is sales, it is also generating demand for, for bank loans. Uh, the critical issue then really is how do we generate demand which will then flow through the economy and essentially bring us out of this recession. Uh, I assume you agree that demand is the key? I do. And one of the things that it appears to me that we have not done uh, here in Congress is really uh, developed a real jobs creation program. And I, I have to say that from my perspective, uh, it does not appear that the administration has done that either. Uh, you may disagree, uh, but that is I do. my perspective. One of the things that we have on our plate that I think we could do that would stimulate demand, and I hear this from my small business owners back in my community, from my bankers, is get the transportation bill passed, which would push dollars into infrastructure. Do you agree with that? I do. I'm a very strong supporter of the need for a very large, much more substantial level of investment over the long term in improving the nation's infrastructure. I think it's important for businesses. Uh, we've underinvested in those. That raises the cost of doing business, taking goods to market. 
There is a very strong economic rationale for doing it. It would help get employment up, people back to work in, in the parts of the economy most affected by the crisis. Very strong e economic case for doing it. So then you would urge us, as one of the positive things we might do to stimulate demand, is to, is to make sure we pass a transportation bill as quickly I, as possible? I would absolutely say that uh, you know, we have to make sure we can pay for it. We do it responsibly. But it is one of the most effective things we could do to help improve uh, the strength of recovery, breadth of recovery, job creation. Thank you. Um, just two other points. You also mentioned during your testimony the Clinton era uh, tax rates. Um, during that period of time, I believe if we look back historically, we also saw significant GDP growth in those years. We did. I think if you, again, if you just compare most measures of economic success, if you compare the, the record of growth, private investment, job creation, income growth, productivity growth uh, between those two periods, employment growth, job growth, uh, the period of the second half of the 90s and the, the decade that followed, um, very good evidence for the type of growth strategies that we are promoting today. And, and so it would appear one could also conclude that those tax rates did not impede either job growth nor GDP growth. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, I think you can, you can say that the economy did very well during that period of time by all the measures we choose to judge economic performance by. And the final question I have for you goes to working capital. Um, just by way of background, I spent 14 years on a bank board uh, and 10 of those years as a permanent member of the Loan Committee. So I think I, I have condol My condolences to you for that. <laughs> I, when we talk about working capital, there is some confusion, I think, that goes on in the conversation. In my view, the strain on the working capital uh, issue is because normally working capital is pegged to uh, inventory and accounts receivable. And because you have declines in working, in working capital, it is because you don't have AR and you don't have inventory. Uh, and there is really not much that I can see the government can do about that directly. That has to come as the result of increased demand. I agree with you completely. I mean, again, it is important to step back and remember what we have been through. We had um, an economy frankly, with uh, too much debt. The economy was falling at a rate of about 5 to 6 percent a year at, when the President took office. Uh, that was going to come with it, a substantial fall in demand for lending. That was going to be magnified as the country uh, pulled back and went to living with its, on its means. No surprise you saw demand for loans fall very, very sharply over that period of time. But that decline would have been much, much worse if we let the financial system burn and collapse. And the case for capital, the case for the programs we put in the emergency is to make sure you didn't see uh, the capacity of the system to support lending contract unnecessarily. And we were very successful not just in putting out the fire at very low cost to the taxpayer, but in bringing rates of, uh, of cost of lending down very dramatically, opening up the credit pipes very quickly. And I am very confident that this financial system today is now in a position where it can finance a growing recovery without concern that there will be a very substantial, meaningful uh, capital constraint on the capacity of the system to lend. There will be pockets of constraints and weakness, but for the system overall, our financial system will be able to support a growing recovery. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I think we are now only beginning to comprehend the extent of the compliance costs um, that will result from the passage of last year's uh, what I would consider to be pro-bureaucracy uh, Dodd-Frank bill. Um, as with any regulation, uh, the smallest firms are going to have the most difficult time complying. They have uh, the least resources to deal with, so it will take up a disproportionate share of their avail available resources in that compliance. Um, while many of the larger uh, financial institutions uh, may be able to weather the increased burden of complying with the Act's uh, existing and proposed regulations, uh, small and community banks uh, are already scrambling uh, to, to survive. Um, how, how can the administration uh, claim to promote access to capital for small businesses uh, when it is smothering the very community banks that are the uh, lifeblood uh, for small business entrepreneurs uh, across this nation? Well, uh, Congressman, I, I think you understand my views on this. Uh, my view is, no surprise to you, that the law was appropriately and carefully designed to reduce the risk 
that it was putting an unnecessary burden on small banks who were not the principal source of the problem, and we rely on a lot to be a source of lending to small businesses going forward. Now, they were not left untouched by the law, but overwhelmingly the thrust of the reforms in the law are targeted at parts of the system they are not part of, at derivatives, mm -hmm. at the complicated risk management challenges facing large firms. And if we had not done that, we would be leaving this economy vulnerable to another crisis like this. And again, this was a crisis exceptionally damaging to the innocent victims among small businesses. I, I've only got a limited time, so this let me say that I, I am hearing uh, still uh, from especially small community type banks and small business entrepreneurs, and you've heard the uncertainty that uh, that this is causing, et cetera. But let me move on to it. Can I just say I, I won't? I, I, I'll, I'll try to. I'll be very but, quick. Let, let me move. Okay. Let me move on if I can. Last year, the administration's major initiative in its uh, so-called jobs bill uh, towards increasing lending to small. Uh, businesses was uh, uh, to push more government spending, uh, in this case to create a $30 billion mini TARP, uh, the Small Business Lending Fund, uh, out of remaining TARP funds. Um, now, your, your Treasury is warning us that we are on the brink of financial catastrophe unless we raise the debt ceiling. Um, in fact, you said in May that a, quote, default would not only increase borrowing costs for the federal government, but also for families, businesses, and local governments, unquote. If we are indeed close to disaster uh, that would severely jeopardize lending, would you be willing to return the remainder of the $30 billion in mini TARP so we can uh, uh, move towards paying down uh, the debt and therefore uh, averting this disaster? Well, uh, uh, of course, the loans that we cannot spend, the resource we cannot spend because we don't have eligible banks for it, go back to the Congress. But unfortunately, they will not make a meaningful contribution to reducing our long-term fiscal problems. But those funds, if not used, will go back to you. You can choose what to do with them. All right. And, and I, I would recommend you put them to deficit reduction. All right. And I'm for deficit reduction, too, so we certainly agree on that. But uh, let, me, let me ask you about that, that, again, the debt ceiling question. The business about uh, that we are going to default, our nation is going to default, we're not, we're the not actual payment. We are not going to default because Congress okay. is going to do what yeah. they need yeah, to do. We are not going to default. I would agree with that. Um, let, me, let me ask you this. How, how much of the actual expenditures goes towards paying down this so-called debt? Is it 15 percent or thereabouts? You mean the interest costs? Yes. Well, you know, we borrow roughly 40 cents for every dollar Congress has authorized us to spend. I've heard up to 43 spend. cents on R a dollar Roughly. Base. Interest costs are a, a much smaller fraction of it. But here's the basic problem, and I think the best, the best analogy is to use a business analogy or a small a family's analogy, which is if, if you stop paying your utility bill, your credit card, uh, and just pay your mortgage, who is going to lend you money? And if you had to refinance your mortgage every month, like we effectively have to do, who would lend you a dollar? So there is no responsible path that avoids default, avoids catastrophic to the, to the economy that has us decide as a country we are going to stop paying all our obligations so we can pay interest. It doesn't work. It is not workable. And it will not relieve Congress of the obligation of raising the limit. Yeah, I, I certainly agree that we shouldn't default, um, and and I would just argue that a lot of the the uh, the sky is going to fall. Uh, it, it, we need to be careful about about that that uh, uh, what's being said. Um, and and also, it's not only yours but Congress's uh, determination. Can I have an additional minute, Mr. Chairman? Uh, the, the determination you can prioritize where the money is spending. You could say. The debt continues to get paid. The Social Security checks continue to go out. Uh, perhaps our troops continue to get paid. But other things, we are going to make su substantial cuts. Uh, let, let me move off that for one last quick question. Um, it was raised here a couple of times. The 9.1 percent unemployment went from 8.6 to 9.1, which is un most unfortunate. We are heading in the wrong direction. But it is really a lot worse than that 9.1, isn't it? I mean, we are talking about the fact that people who used to be full-time, some are now working part-time, people are underemployed, they may have a college education, and they are now uh, perhaps working uh, in, in the fast food industry flipping burgers, although lots of people do that. It is respectable work. Um, but perhaps they didn't need a four-year college degree uh, to do that. Um, and, and the people are just, uh, and, and a significant group has stopped looking altogether. And those, group, those ones I just mentioned aren't even included in that nine. 0.1 percent. So really, it's worse than that. Would you agree? Uh, well, a uh, quick response. First, uh, 
you are asking what are my judgments right about the broader consequences of default. But what I would just ask you to do quickly, ask your staff to show you letters written by every President, every Secretary of the Treasury who has faced this problem over the last several decades. Can you will see in Ronald Reagan and Jim Baker and others eloquent testimony to the risks of contemplating what you are proposing. There is no responsible path for making that work. On and the job stuff. Let me just interrupt you for a second. And you know your boss said that it was irresponsible to vote to increase the debt ceiling and voted against it as well. well he, and and he, he also, the said, he also said Obama. that that was a mistake for him, as have many people have said that, that it was a mistake. mistake yeah. But he but didn't again, vote but that way. On the specific question you are suggesting is go back and look at my Republican predecessors. You will see they have made the same judgment. On the jobs front, again, I would say this. You are absolutely right that you know, the national averages mask a lot of uh, differences across the country. Unemployment is much higher in many ways. But remember, it is 2 million private sector jobs since job growth started. Hours worked have increased more than that, and incomes are growing because the economy is growing as a whole. But right. we have a long way to go to dig out of it. Our collective task responsibility is to figure out how best, right. how best to do that. And the population has increased as well. So we have to put on jobs just to tread water. You do. You are exactly right about that. Okay. And thank you, yeah. Mr. Secretary. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. On behalf of the ranking member, and, and I might point out that the only reason for her absence, she was managing amendments in another committee, um, which was completely unavoidable. And uh, so I, on behalf of the ranking member and myself, we appreciate very much uh, you being here and uh, your testimony, and we are going to get you out of here uh, on time. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to extend and revise their remarks. And I would also ask unanimous consent that the record for this hearing be left open for 14 days in order to have members submit questions and the Secretary respond. Uh, without objection, that is so ordered. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much.